uh, sid.contact really is a cluster of uh, IPNI nodes, right? Is it really? Ah, it has fangs, right? It is, this, this thing is built to uh, handle heavy load. Right? Uh, it is the largest, most complete IPNI instance, if you like, both in terms of the features, stays to the latest, as well as the amount of data that it has. But success for me is that it shouldn't be for long, right? hopefully. Uh, a quick timeline of uh, C.contact. Started life in April uh, last year. Was the only running IPNI service. We got it integrated into Lotus 1.15. Uh, since then, Lotus nodes have been uh, native IPNI providers. In August last year, uh, at the uh, previous IPFS thing, uh, we talked about how it's been growing. So we have we have over eight we had over eight billion sits ingested by sit.contact. Entire NFT storage uh, data was indexed by sit.contact. There's a talk on this that you highly recommend looking up on a uh, previous uh, IPFS thing. And we had about 20% of Filecoin deals being uh, indexed. Fast forward October uh, last year, IPFS camp, we had just about 800 billion seeds ingested. Too many zeros for my small brain. Uh, about 7 billion CIDs per week being ingested. This is more, almost the same amount as what we totally had in August, and this is per week. We have six partners running uh, indexer instances, so sit.contact is not the only one. There's actually six more out there. If you go to sit.contact, you can see the li list. Collab clusters fully indexed, thanks to the great work that was done by Ivan. And we had Hydra boosters hooked up to sit.contact. Uh, this was when uh, Kubo did not have default to sit.contact, so the way by which content was being looked up on behalf of the clients was they have a high pro probability of hitting one of the Hydra boosts in the DHD, and then Hydra boosters would do the nice thing of also looking up uh, content for them at sit.contact. Uh, so that was all done. By December uh, last year, we passed the threshold we've been striving for, 1 trillion uh, CIDs. That's 10 to 12. Uh, we changed, we made significant changes in the back end. We moved to a more performant uh, a value store that was fitting the use case of um, network indexers called Pebble. Uh, this is the data store that's used in Cockroach TV. Uh, we had over 50% reduction in the uh, running cost of uh, sit.contact. Uh, we are pretty proud of that considering the rate of growth never slowed down. So we are doing even more, but with, with uh, half the cost. And in December 2022, the uptime was 100% for the first time. For the, for the, for the first quarter, we had 100% uptime, which is amazing. And this, this is credit to the work that the team's been doing in terms of stabilizing things and turning this really from an implementation into a uh, IPNI itself from an implementation into a protocol and established instance of a data set of content. Today, we have 1.3 trillion uh, CIDs, about 300 billion more. Uh, we have a lookup uh, uh, traffic of 250,000 requests per minute. This actually reduced significantly uh, over the last uh, six months or so. We'll, we'll go, into there, go, go into that, but it was about uh, four to five times that before. Uh, again, this uh, last quarter, we hit another 100% uptime. Not going to jinx it, but really great to see. 46% of Filecoin deals are, are now covered by sit.contact. So you've got the probability of 46% 46, uh, uh, 46 probability of finding your data uh, that you stored on uh, Filecoin. Right? And just to give you a little window, this number is actually a lot better than you think it is because we believe that we have over 96% of new deals being indexed in, in, in IPNI. And that is a much more interesting a number because uh, there's a lot of historical deals and so on in Filecoin that never gets touched. So uh, the probability that you should really be taking away from this slide is 96%. Uh, 
and the chances are 96% you can find your data if you have made a deal in Filecoin recently. C.contact is now the built-in default, uh, de one of the default delegated routing uh, endpoints since Kubo 118 that was uh, shipped in January. Uh, thanks to the huge undertaking by both the IPNI team and the IP stewards, uh, it took a lot of doing. So honestly, uh, fantastic to see this happening. Brings the clients closer to the benefits of sort of thing we're building. And this is just the beginning. Uh, we haven't even started scratching the surface. We are, we're going to talk about the provider side too. I, uh, C .contact is also the default Lassie content router. Uh, this is how Lassie uh, separates the concern of the content discovery from uh, content uh, delivery. Uh, uh, we have now cascading uh, rolled out into C .contact, so you can uh, try out the protocols that I bored you with earlier uh, on C .contact, actually see it in action. And we have a streaming uh, rolled out on C.contact, which gives you five times faster uh, uh, lookup. Uh, the number five could uh, fluctuate between five to 500, I think, depending on the size of um, and popularity of your content, because the latency, if you're doing it non-streaming, is a factor of the number of providers found for that CID. So it's hard to quantify it, but it is much, much faster. If, if you're building applications that looks up content, uh, streaming is the way to go full stop. If you have been paying attention, C.Conta is now one year old. Uh, it was, yeah. Amazing work. Uh, this is today, or it's not exactly today, but uh, I think it was, it's 22nd of April as probably um, the, the birthday of C.Conta. So this, this little service of ours has been uh, standing one. Uh, in October, I presented the topology of C.contact, uh, which looked a bit like this. Uh, this was an IPFS camp, pretty simple, uh, typical setup in, in like a centralized sort of uh, system. The only novelty there is index star in the middle uh, here. Uh, can I move the mouse? Yeah. Uh, here, which uh, does the scatter gather across multiple nodes. Uh, so for every request, it asks all the nodes in the backend and collects the results. Wait for it. Now it looks like a bit like this, right? Took me hours to make this document. But this <laughs> yeah. So a lot's been happening. Uh, I'm gonna go through this very quickly. Uh, the first thing, we have assigner service, which uh, takes care of optimizing the right path. And when I say right path, I mean the path by which the content is ingested by network indexers. And this is thanks to the great work that Andrew's been doing. Uh, we now have a mechanism by which we uh, handle announcements that are made by the providers and explicitly assign it to a node. And that means that each node now, rather than having the full uh, records, it has a slice through the records. Uh, we have been working on double hashing and uh, reader privacy. Uh, this is largely the work that uh, a nice work that Ivan has been working on. Uh, what we are actually doing right now is testing this whole flow in production using Canary uh, uh, requests that are hitting our production endpoint. So we have built a service which is called dhfind uh, that does the encryption of requests from unencrypted CIDs on your behalf and then looks the data up into a backend that is only storing uh, encrypted information. We have built a bespoke uh, piece of software to store this um, uh, private uh, uh, encrypted information, which is called DH Store, uh, and that is also backed by Pebble. Uh, we have rolled out uh, mirroring in production, which uh, helps us speed up re-ingestion of advertisements for the purposes of uh, double hashing and privacy, but as well as setting the stepping stones in terms of having a federated uh, IPNI network. That is the work that Andrew has been uh, working on and gives a presentation later on today. Uh, moving on, Pebble. Sorry, go ahead. May, may I interrupt just one second? Sure. What exactly is Great question. Uh, so the question is, uh, what exactly is encrypted and why? Uh, this is a, an effort to make the reader privacy, uh, make the lookups uh, 
private uh, um, to the network itself. So it will stop me as a, as a service provider snooping on you that you know, Martin is looking up Sid whatever every, every two hours, for example. I, I won't be able to do this type of thing. Uh, this, there's a whole talk on this later on today on uh, privacy, uh, both on the uh, specification side that uh, Guy's been working on, uh, changes that it, uh, it incurs on the DHT side, as well as the changes in IP and I. So great question. Please keep that in mind. We'll get back to it. Great question. So, uh, so the, the, the question is, we are doing the encryption here on behalf of the client. Why? That is not secure, right? <laughs> so the, the idea is that um, the double hashing would um, require changes on the client side for them to do the encryption. Uh, we have libraries built for the clients, but they need to adopt it, right? And also, uh, on the server side, we want to test the whole thing to make sure that the encrypted data actually works. Because once it's encrypted, you can't go back. Right? So this is the idea behind DHFind, to do the encryption on behalf of the client. And this is why we are canarying the connections, just to, as a testing mechanism, uh, to make sure everything is working. And then eventually, once everything is working, we're going to end up a period where uh, we will have both type of traffic. Right? We have clients that are adopted, clients that are not. But in the back end, we don't want to deal with the complexity of having to, complexity of having to store encrypted and non-encrypted data, right? So in the future, what we see this, this service being useful as is not only testing, but also reduce complexity in the back end by just us having to store encrypted data full stop, less responsibility on our side. Whenever clients are ready, we just have one service to burn, not restructuring, right? Uh, going back to the uh, topology, the Pebble data store is now the default. If you're running uh, IP9 instances, go migrate today. There's never been a better day. Uh, save uh, a lot on the running costs, faster lookup, and so on. And the main thing here to point out is that the back end of Network Indexer uh, deals with mutable data. If you remember, you have multi-hashes that point to a key that then point to information that changes. The number of key, the multi-hash mapping to key is you know, one to many, so the, this list fluctuates. So you're dealing with dynamic data. And for that, you need a data store that, can, that is optimized for changing content. right? So that's why uh, Pebble was a really good choice for us. We have rolled out cascading. So we have two new services, Cascade DHT uh, for the cascading over DHT, and Cassette for the legacy stuff. Who remembers the storing? Uh, music on, on cassette off the radio, right? I do. Great. That's why we call it the legacy thing, right? Uh, for the Cascade DHT, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go over these a, a little bit deeper later today. And of course, if you look at the fleet that's being looked up, uh, we have so many things that are sitting behind this poor little index star service that does the scatter gather. Uh, the main thing to point out there is, yeah, that doesn't look like a fast service to me. There's a lot of lookups going on. And the answer is uh, we have rolled out streaming down to the core of the system. So regardless of whether the request that is hitting index star is streaming or not, we turn it into a streaming request and scatter it across all the nodes because all our backend nodes support streaming and then return the first one that we uh, uh, find. And then if the client was asking for a streaming request, great, we are good friends, right? We, we just return it as is. Uh, if not, then we just accumulate the information over a period of uh, up to like a uh, number of seconds and just return the information. But without a doubt, this has a fact on the latency uh, and I'll, I'll get back to that later. Uh, cache hit rate. If you, if you have paid attention right in front of the, this whole thing, there's a heavy uh, CloudFront cache that caches all the success requests for up to an hour and uh, as well as 404s for up to 10 minutes. This is the thing that allows us to cope with the amount of traffic that is hitting us. Uh, the cache hit rate um, fluctuated significantly uh, because of the events that happened end of last year, like for example, Hydra drawdown. Uh, so the type of traffic pattern that we see is slightly different. Uh, there was a reduction also in the amount of requests that we're receiving because of Hydra drawdown. 
lots going on there. The main thing to point out here is just fluctuation of the amount of requests. Uh, so I, I put the number 250,000 per minute earlier. Um, you can see how high it was before. And that there's a blip on the end right there, which is where the RIA testing started. So uh, we are feeling reasonably confident in terms of being able to handle the sort of traffic that uh, looking up the entire content address data out there can throw at us. Uh, but obviously, uh, we need to get even more efficient to be able to uh, not only reduce our own costs, but also convince others in terms of running. Uh, the ratio of 404s. Uh, so this is pretty high uh, when you look at it. The line that you see significant there is uh, just change in the specification of from uh, you know returning to 200 to returning 404 instead. That's why it jumped up. But the main thing to point out is that the ratio for force is pretty high. I'll, I'll dive deeper into that and rationale behind that. Uh, the, the long story there is that the requests that are hitting us don't always have the cascade parameters set. Uh, and the IPNI network itself has a you know, proportion of the total stuff that's being looked up. That's why you get the 404s. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so in, in the back, if you look at the back end, the cache misses, the ratio of 404s is sort of 50 50, fluctuates. Uh, a few weeks back for the first time, we had twice as many 200s than, than we had uh, 404s. Uh, but the really true number to look at in terms of 404s is what are the cache misses on, on the back end? Um, and what do they result to? And that is sort of 50-50 right now. Uh, closing the gap. So we have, we have been working on closing the gap to, uh, and this whole effort is driven by Project RIA and uh, the LASI project that I mentioned, uh, which is using IPNI as a content routing system. Uh, two projects rolled out, Cascade DHT. Uh, right now, the implementation lives there. Uh, it is using full uh, uh, RT client as a way of looking up information. It is running over a cluster of five instances on pretty beefy machines. Uh, lookup success of about uh, 40%. Uh, this is every time anybody looks up something that has cascade equals IPFS DHT, we're going to forward to the service. And of those service lookups, we have get 40%. This is getting hit about 80,000 uh, requests per minute. Uh, the main thing to point out there is that uh, uh, full RT um, or, or implementations of DHT client, uh, they're less suited for running as a long running service. Uh, they're perhaps uh, CPU in intensive. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of work going on there in the IPNI team to see how we can scale that better and make it make a DHT client that could be used as a you know, efficient long running service and fits that use case more. But Plenty of research to be done there. Uh, we hope to work closely with the folks at Probe Lab to kind of uh, experiment with alternatives there. Uh, more to come. Time to first bite. Uh, pretty fast, uh, you know, at P99, about 200 milliseconds, which is good. Uh, moving on to cassette, uh, this is a very, very cherry picked implementation uh, that speaks BitSwap. It uses the vanilla box of bit swap implementation, uh, but um, with a twist. And uh, I recommend you going to have a look at that repo. Uh, this is a service that you could run yourself. Like all of this is open source, so you can run it if you really need to discover data only over uh, bit swap, available only over bit swap with explicit uh, peering. Uh, it has a whole bunch of metrics to allow us to judge when to get rid of it because we, we are keen to kind of reduce moving parts and focus on uh, a new set of protocols that uh, enable uh, lookup. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of metrics that allows you to see things like the rate of uh, publication. There's things like circuit breakers to fall back and not spam the network. The main concern there is for us to build this with, uh, while being a really good citizen to the uh, content address network. Uh, it's easy to write a system, write a BitSwap client that spams the world. Uh, so, and that's not something that we want to uh, encourage. So instead, this is bespokely written, very, very uh, careful decision making to reduce uh, this uh, noisiness. Uh, traffic, same as Cascade DHD, and the reason for that is I think there's only one client right now that is using those parameters, and that's Lassie. So uh, that's why it's a fraction of the total traffic that you see. 
on cassette, we get a little bit more higher uh, look of success, about 45%, uh, and that's really just the result of the type of CIDs that's being looked up. Again, time to first bite. Uh, it is pretty fast when it's going, but uh, it can fluctuate, and the fluctuation there you see is a result of um, peering clients basically redeploying or disconnecting, uh, and then the circuit breaker is open, and you know all, all these things happen in the background, but it is pretty choppy, and it's just the nature of BitSwap. So this affects our upstream latency significantly, so you, you can see when, when these requests, uh, these services were, were rolled out, uh, this was before we uh, rolled out streaming all the way to the back end. So, uh, you know, from latency perspective, having these edges is not great. Uh, but what we are hoping for is to have a better way of just making that content available into an IPNI full stop. Uh, in terms of success, kinda I, I showed you, uh, you know, numbers on the lookup success. Uh, if we zoom in on the lookup success that uh, RIA sees, for example, Project RIA, uh, this is a, um, metrics that are generated by a service called Lookout, uh, which gets a set, of, a set of CIDs and repeatedly looks them up against a given uh, endpoint to see lookup success. The list of CIDs that is being looked up by this service, you can find the code there. Um, you can test your own IPNI instance with it. Uh, these CIDs come from uh, Saturn. There's an endpoint that lists the top CIDs. And after rolling out this cascading, which is BitSwap was the last, uh, last one, you can see the lookup success kind of increasing significantly. And right now we are at parity with the old, uh, with, with the existing BitSwap, uh, IPFS gateway in terms of lookup success. So we can find as many CIDs as the other BitSwap nodes can, can find with the help of cascading over two networks, uh, DHT and the BitSwap. And this is explicitly uh, the lookup success of uh, requests sent by uh, Lassie. So the previous one was just testing a data set. Uh, this one is live traffic that is uh, hitting, uh, hitting us from RIA project via Lassie to fill in the cache misses. Uh, and you can see the significant increase in the uh, lookup success there. Running costs. How much all this is costing us, right? A lot. We want it to be free and we want it to run by others, right? But uh, we're running it today. Half of the cost right now goes on the storage, uh, EBS volumes. 30% uh, of that is uh, just the caching. Uh, we look to optimize that further. We have done a whole bunch of work in optimizing uh, EBS volumes, but not so much on the caching front, so we'll hit that later. 10% of that is just uh, spend on raw compute and miscellaneous uh, uh, VPN, VPC, sorry, um, egress and so on, 10% uh, of that. So this, is, this gives you a rough estimation of how much things would cost you relative to category. Takeaways, go use the streaming NDJSON now, right? That, that's the, if you wanna take one line away, please use NDJSON. We, wanna, we don't wanna see accept JSON anymore on, on the request side. Um, go switch to Pebble if you're running an IP, IPNI node, much, much cheaper, much faster. And cascading lookups. Now IPNI or SID.contact is turning into a one-stop shop for looking things up. So if you want to build stuff on top of it, uh, there has never been a better time than now. Uh, you have a single, simple uh, REST API to look content address data up and not only look up who has it, but also have reasonable understanding of protocols over which you can query stuff, which is quite powerful. Feature work. Uh, read path optimization. We have spent a lot of time on the write path optimization. We're going to move to read path, uh, make the lookups even faster uh, with the help of uh, double hashing. Um, uh, Ivan would go into the whole double hashing story uh, later on today. We, are, we want to shift left from uh, cascading. What does shift left mean? If you have cascade on the right hand side, uh, an IPNI here which cascades to it. We want to shift the content so that it's more available on the IPNI side so that you don't have to do the cascade at all. Uh, and that is a whole category of works uh, in terms of reducing barriers that I touched on earlier. More caching because we want to reduce uh, trust in C.contact. contact. This, this is both caching on the edge where the, look, uh, the, the data is being looked up, for example, on the closer to RIA side, as well as HTTP caching. Um, uh, it, it, it makes up a good chunk of our costs, and I think we can be much, much more efficient there if we design a cache system that is built for the use case of sit.contact. 
And uh, uh, over the last two quarters or so, there's been a tsunami of metrics that are being collected and engineered into SID.contact. Uh, there's a whole bunch of really interesting information there. Uh, what we really want to do is to make that into a public uh, dashboard so that you don't have to be bored by my, dis uh, my talks and you can just go onto a website and see things straight up. Um, that would be beautiful. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Please find us again at Falcon Slack IPNI. Uh, there's a whole team behind this, uh, names there. There's a whole bunch of people across uh, Bedrock that have the patience to try the things that we're building and even more patient people out there that are trying these things. So I'm grateful to all of you. Um, a bunch of links there for interesting repos to look at in terms of implementation and tools if you're looking at running IPNI. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it over to you for questions. Thank you. So why do you test? Why do you want to use NDJSON, or why prefer the streaming NDJSON? So as we add new ways by which uh, providers could be discovered, we find that the, the list of discovered providers is growing. Uh, there are uh, stats on P90s of a uh, number of providers that are found, and this can go up to like 150 provider records, right? Now, if you don't have the streaming mechanism, in the back end, we see that this information is being found, right? But because of the safeguards of worst latency that we are willing to give back to clients, we have to cut this off, right? So what is, what is actually happening is that we're finding information that client wants, but we are hitting the P99 latency that we absolutely have to return stuff, and yet we are not returning that value that really exists in the back end. And that is basically the, the, the reason, you know? Because what we really want is to return that information, uh, all that information to the user, and more importantly, what we really want is to not decide for the client how long I'm willing to wait to collect the stuff for you. You just choose it. As long as you stay connected, you get results. If you get bored, if there's too much information, just cut off the connection, right? Obviously, there's room for improvement there in terms of how do you order the list of providers that are found. Uh, there's a whole other discussion, but uh, the main thing is to just give the power back to the users and avoid making application layer de uh, design decisions on IPNI because that's not what we want to do, right? What do you, what do you think the path is to uh, decentralizing this, to getting other people taking up the burden of, of some of this infrastructure in a decentralized way. And, and uh, if that works out the way you want, what is the, what is the rump? What is the stuff that you can imagine uh, Protocol Labs still running into the future? That is a great question. Why should you run this thing when SID.contact exists? So uh, do you remember I said we don't want to enable making out of Google Analytics? So uh, there's another thing that occurs to me, which is when I look stuff up on Google, it is free for me. Uh, I find stuff, but the way that Google makes money is by ranking, advertisement, and whatever. Obviously, we don't want to add ads into this, for sure. Uh, but then, uh, for me, still there's a lesson there, right? Uh, in that lookup or content routing is the gateway to the actual functionality that people are looking for. Right? And we already have uh, systems, designs, implementations that focus on incentivization of uh, retrieval, right? Uh, like the Filecoin system, for example. Uh, we have ways by which retrieval could be paid, right? You have paid retrieval, unpaid retrieval. Uh, this is all in the making, right? So if you think about it, as somebody who is providing the lookup service, uh, you would be in, a, in an excellent position to then uh, upsell or provide a whole ecosystem or market for retrieval of the data that's being looked up, right? So um, this, is, this is one path that I see this in, uh, in terms of uh, incentivization of a uh, whole lookup mechanism. You touched on wh what the decentralized thing would look like. I would love to see a, a reputation system that is uh, giving uh, multiple clients information to choose their own instances. 
Uh, it's not just a completeness here. There's other parameters like locality. If I want to look something up in Australia, I really don't want to connect to US West to look it up. Uh, so, you know, if there is an instance there that could give me information much faster because I'm building a live editing app on top of content address data, because why not? It shouldn't exist, right? Uh, so, lookup matters there, right? So, uh, what I, the way that I see this working out is replications of data, re replications of uh, information across multiple nodes that are geographically distributed. Uh, a federation layer on top of that, which guarantees hard problems like uh, g uh, eventual consistency across these, uh, but it has to be optimized based on flow of traffic. You really don't want to copy things very fast that are never touched and are only accessed on US West into Australia, for example. So there's a whole bunch of questions to be figured out there. Uh, and the next thing that I see uh, this growing is really breaking down the service by which we provide this uh, lookup mechanism, there could be many, many tiers here. Uh, for example, uh, the ranking of the which, uh, the rank of the way by which re results are returned could be optimized to provide a better service. Uh, the amount of information that's being ingested could be meters. So for example, if you have this much information, it's okay, free tier. If you have more information, it's that much. Separation between hot and cold data, for example. So. There could be a totally new paid version of sit.contact, for example, that um, guarantees that once you publish something, it is discoverable within 20 milliseconds, right? And you could build a system around that and charge people for that because, because content providers are charging people for retrieval, right? So it would make sense for them to then pay for this, right? Uh, how much of this would uh, PL build? Um, success for me is that all of this is driven by the community because uh, I think it is very true that nobody in this room, in this community, knows what the future of this decentralized web that we are building would look like really. Right? And nobody knows the answer. So what can we do in, uh, in the meantime? I would love to engineer more of these tuning knobs into this whole ecosystem that uh, enables experimentation. It, that is the most important, most powerful thing that I see we can do as a community, to just engineer swap swappable things that enables uh, groups of independent people to experiment, and then in forums like this, share their experiences so that together we can build something that, uh, like I mentioned, not only matches the Web2, but really smashes it because it has to be much, much faster, right? So this is the path that I see in terms of growth. I hope that answers your question.